Thank you very much for that kind introduction, and I'm honored to be leading the first panel this morning and to be the token male on the panel. Um, that is good for me. Um, I am delighted to have the clicker, and I'm delighted to be introducing this panel. This really is a star cast. As you heard yesterday from our provost at MIT, the MIT motto is men's at manus, mind and hand. And uh, as a recent recruit to MIT, and particularly its management school, MIT really does do this, men's at manus. Not only do we have PhDs who then on to go on to become fabulous entrepreneurs, we also take the best of our research and try to apply it in the real world. So I am thrilled to have this panel this morning. Uh, the details are behind me. The way we're going to run this panel this morning is I'm going to start off with our two very learned professors, and then we'll go to our two practitioners. But let me briefly introduce the panel so you know the star cast we have up here this morning. First of all, I'd like to introduce Professor Suzanne Berger from the uh, MIT Political Science Department. She was founder of MIT's international program, MISTI, uh, and especially its MIT France program. In the United States, she's been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and back here in Europe, she's been honored by the French government with the highest honor of Légion d'honneur. Um, today, which as those from MIT uh, know is Pi Day, in American calendar reference, it's, it's 3 slash 14, 3.14. It just shows you the kind of culture we come from in MIT that we like to celebrate Pi Day. Um, but that's particularly appropriate because Pi is also the uh, acronym of Professor Berger's most recent research, Production in the uh, Economic Knowledge, Innovation Economy. I can't read my own handwriting. Um, and that is very pertinent for today to look back at this deep research um, and particularly the role of manufacturing in our advanced economies. So that is Professor Berger, and in a moment I will invite her to speak first. To my right uh, over here is Professor F Fiona Murray, who is a professor of entrepreneurship at MIT's management school, the Sloan School. She is an associate dean of innovation, and she is co-lead with Professor Bulovich of the provosts and MIT's Pan-MIT Innovation Initiative. So we look forward to hearing from her about innovation, and particularly the science of innovation, uh, which is what the Laboratory for Innovation Science and Policy is all about. Then we will turn to Donna from Scotland, and that's when we will go from the men's to the manners side. We will take that high-level MIT research and science of innovation and hear how it's being applied in the real world. So Donna will speak about the experience of Scotland, and as you will see, our title for this panel is Ecosystems in the European Union. Not everybody in the European Union is in the Euro area, uh, but somehow they still manage to have innovation and entrepreneurship. So we will be hearing from Scotland and how the experience of applying MIT lessons through our REAP program have gone up there in the Highlands and Islands. And then we will turn to Lourdes, the other end of Europe, to hear about that experience down in Granada in southern Spain. So with that, may I please first turn to Professor Suzanne Berger. to my PowerPoint. Corey's just going to turn it on that short drive. So I just hit this? I think you can turn that one. Okay. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today, and I, I'd like to tell you a little about a project that uh, was run at MIT uh, between 2009 and 2013, and it involved 20 faculty from departments across the institute and a number of our graduate students. And uh, the question we were asking was, uh, what does it take to bring innovation to market? What are the kinds of inputs that are required to bring innovation to market? Uh, uh, inputs being skills, training, capital, suppliers, knowledge, facilities, and policies. And in particular, do we need any manufacturing in our country? Do we need any production in our country in order to get innovation into the market. And it was clear to us, particularly at a place like MIT, that the United States excels at innovation, but there is a question about whether we can really get full value from our innovation uh, if we don't have the ability to bring it to market in, in the United States. And by full value, I mean the ability to build on innovation in the creation 
of new companies, new good jobs, uh, and uh, future, streams of, uh, future streams of innovation. And I think if you think back to 2009, when this project was launched, a time when um, not only what was, was, were financial markets uh, in, in dire crisis, but we saw something like six million uh, jobs in, in, in manufacturing over the decade uh, collapsing, three million alone in, in the course of the financial and economic crisis. And I think on all of our minds was this question of maybe, maybe when we look at the leading American companies, a company like Apple, we see that Apple does research, it does design, it does distribution, but it doesn't do any production at all. And yet Apple reaps the lion's share of the profits from the, from the sale of its, of its products. So maybe the model for the United States, for everybody, uh, should be an Apple model. That is, should we really believe that production can just take place somewhere else without loss of our ability to bring innovation uh, to market in a way that is profitable, not only for American companies, but uh, created uh, po with the possibility of creation of good jobs. So that was, in a way, what was, what was, what was on our, our mind here. And when we talk about bringing innovation to market, I think that we had in our group a definition of innovation that went well beyond the definitions that we heard here yesterday. We were thinking not only of Oslo-type uh, innovation, we were thinking of a very broad spectrum of innovation, not only innovation in the form of patents, but innovation in uh, business processes and organizations and manufacturing from uh, what we can see uh, at one end of the spectrum as patentable, disruptive, path-breaking, you could say MIT-type innovation, but also new business models, repurposing of old uh, ideas into uh, into new products and new models, all the way to the other end of the spectrum where you'd see a company like Procter & Gamble uh, making changes in the production of very ordinary items like diapers, uh, but in ways that uh, allow them uh, to make radical improvements in the rapidity and efficiency of the way in which they were producing these very standard items. So we saw innovation across the United States in companies of all sizes. And our question was, in companies of all sizes and kinds, in innovations of a very wide variety, what does it take to get them into the hands of a customer? And in order to carry out this research, we broke up into work groups. Uh, overall, in the course of the project, we carried out interviews in about 265 companies. In each company, we asked relentlessly one question. And the one question was, when you have a new idea, when you see a new idea coming up, either out of the lab or off the shop floor, what do you need to do to get it into the hands of a customer? And we asked those questions in metalworking shops in the middle of, of Ohio. We asked those questions in Fortune 500 companies. Uh, a second component of the study uh, was a study of startup trajectories. We looked at all of the startups that came out of MIT's technology licensing office in the years 1997, 2007. There were, in fact, 200 such companies. We set aside the 50 that came out in software, because that's a relatively uh, easy thing to scale up. And we looked at the 150 that involved uh, harder technologies to scale. Uh, we uh, looked at a sample of uh, what we called Main Street manufacturing companies in Massachusetts, Ohio, Georgia, and Arizona. We then looked at some matched companies in Germany and China. We did technology scans and surveys. We did a study of skills in American manufacturing establishments. And on the skills side, I would just point out that in those years, 2009, 2010, just about the only thing that you could get people to agree on in the Republican and Democratic parties in the United States was that there was a skills gap, that our problem in the United States was 
somehow that our workers didn't have the kind of skills that companies needed. This seemed to us a rather dubious proposition because after all, three million people had just lost jobs and it seemed unlikely uh, that the jobs that they, if they re reasonably recently had jobs, it seemed unlikely that the skills that were required would have changed so rapidly as to require wholly different people and skills. And so we uh, sent out questionnaires to uh, 2,000 manufacturing establishments asking them not, is there a skills gap? Because that had become like apple pie and motherhood. We didn't ask them that, we asked them one simple question. We asked how long did it take to fill the last position in your company when you wanted to fill a job? And in 75% of the answers of the companies, it took them less than a month. So we came to see that perhaps the question of skills was not really the main, the main problem that we were looking at on that front. What we did see, and I think the, uh, uh, if we had more time, I'd love to go into this in more detail, that there had been an enormous transformation of corporate structures in the United States from the 1980s to today. Uh, in the 1980s, the leading companies in the United States were vertically integrated uh, large companies in which research, development, design, production, manufacturing all took place under the roof of the same company. And what we've seen over the course of 30 years is a breakdown of that model so that today a company that is integrated in that way, a company like General Electric, for example, is the rare beast. And almost all of the companies that were the, the vertically integrated champions of the 80s have now been reduced to core competence firms. This breakup of the vertically integrated firm took place under very severe pressure from financial markets. And that's, uh, and of course, it was enabled by new technologies. But financial markets played a very large role in this breakup of the vertically integrated firm. And the breakup of vertically integrated firms has had an enormous impact on the industrial ecosystem of the United States. What we've seen is, uh, over the last 30 years, enormous holes develop in the industrial ecosystem because when uh, innovation took place in large companies, in those vertically integrated firms in the 1980s, they had the resources to do scale up. Think of a company like DuPont. When DuPont invented nylon in its laboratories in the 1930s and 1940s, uh, first of all, they had basic, something like basic research labs at DuPont in those days. Those were the days of Bell Laboratory, of Xerox Park, of IBM Central Research Laboratories. Those facilities simply don't exist anymore. But when you did have something like basic research taking place in companies and came up with something like nylon at a DuPont, DuPont had the money, the resources, and the skills to scale that up to market within the four walls of DuPont. They had plants that they were able to convert and did convert from viscose and acetate to nylon production. They had workers and managers that they were, they were willing to retrain for working in nylon plants. They had equity uh, that, that allowed them to, uh, 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 to borrow and to finance the uh, enormous uh, uh, capital requirements of, of extensive nylon production. And so all of this could take place uh, within the vertically integrated firm. Today, those firms don't exist any longer. And the question is, where do we get the resources today for scale up? Where do we get the skills retraining, reformation that are necessary for moving into radically new enterprises? So I think, uh, uh, when we look at the small and medium scale mainstream, uh, main street manufacturers, they need to be able to access complementary capabilities from the ecosystem. They don't have the capabilities uh, that would allow them on their own to be scaling up uh, their own innovations. It used to be the case that skill formation took place within the large, uh, within the large companies and then apprentices who were trained within big companies leaked out into the ecosystem and small and medium firms could hire people with those skills. There are very few large companies in the United States 
or any companies in the United States today that are training apprentices. And that means that, uh, in fact, we have to provide, we have to come up with another model for skill training. How do we educate the workforce we need absent uh, the, the models of skill training we used to have? And finally, uh, these holes in the ecosystem refer to the difficulty of actually getting transformative technology that we see on the horizon at places like MIT. How do we get it into the hands of those firms that might actually be able to use it? So we came to see the making of a new industrial ecosystem as the most urgent challenge that we face in the United States that if we want to get the best of our innovation into the marketplace, we need to rebuild capabilities in the industrial ecosystem. We need to fill the holes that have been created by a process of corporate transformation. There was much that was good in the course of this, uh, of, of the enormous transformation of American corporations, but we have failed to provide the infrastructure for a new industrial ecosystem. And in rebuilding, I think our goal has to be to raise the rate and speed of bringing innovation to market across the country. And what we came to believe in the course of the project was that the, the, the direction we ought to move is to build institutions that could allow for convening, coordinating, risk pooling, and risk reduction in trying to rebuild the ecosystem. And so I know that you're gonna be hearing about some of the projects that are relying on regional ecosystem rebuilding, but I would like just to signal some of the projects and some of the directions that the United States has been moving uh, that, that, that follow a rather different pathway. And the pathways that we're seeing are ones, or recommending, are ones that might have common principles. And I think the principles we're looking for are experiments in building these complementary capabilities. Uh, by capabilities, I mean uh, uh, skill formation, uh, something to replace the local banks in local ecosystems. We don't have any local banks anymore in the United States. And when we went to Germany and learned about the role of local banks in supporting Mittelstand uh, firms, as they try to bring new firms, uh, new projects to market, we realized how valuable uh, a, a component of a total uh, uh, industrial ecosystem a local bank can be. So how do we, uh, ex what kind of experiments can we imagine in building com complementary capabilities? What kinds of designs can we imagine so that no one company pulling out kills the institution? How can we learn to use public funds to incentivize the contribution of private and other actors, not to substitute for them? And we believe that one very interesting experiment in the United States on a national level has been the creation of uh, manufacturing innovation institutes. This was a major initiative of the Obama administration, and I think uh, that uh, our uh, MIT Production in the Innovation Economy project really contributed substantially to the, um, to the thinking that went into the creation of these projects. These are projects um, that uh, build around particular technologies. So the first of them, the Additive Manufacturing Project, uh, uh, which is now three years old, was uh, a project around 3D printing. The government announced, uh, uh, announced that it would put a, a sum of money on the table. Initially, it was $40 million and ask companies, universities, uh, community colleges uh, to uh, come uh, to compete in a competition that required coming as a team. And 12 teams applied for those federal funds for additive manufacturing. Uh, the winning team had two universities, Carnegie Mellon and Case Western, and a wide variety of small, medium, and large, uh, and large companies. The money came from the federal government through the Defense Department. And uh, they're now uh, basically, it's located in Youngstown, Ohio. There are now 15 such institutes uh, involved. Actually, MIT is involved in, in nine of them. I think we haven't yet uh, had a chance to evaluate these projects, 
but they, they have these elements that I describe as common principles. Basically, the idea is to try to create public goods or semi-public goods that, uh, or club goods that would allow a diversity of actors to benefit from capabilities that no single firm uh, is able to create on its own. And we're very interested, um, I think one of our next steps would be to try to understand uh, whether these institutes are in fact uh, uh, operating in that sense. Here in Europe, there are comparable models. If you look at the French Pôle de Compétitivité, that, um, that's a somewhat similar model. Uh, the French, however, have 70 of these Pôle de Compétitivité. Uh, uh, so it's a little hard to compare them to something that's, I think, a more concentrated and focused model, uh, which is the American uh, Manufacturing Innovation Institutes, each of which now has on um, average about $70 million of federal funding and an equal or larger uh, sum from the states and individual industries. So thanks, and I look forward to the hearing about the regional model. Definitely. Well, Professor Berger, thank you very much for setting out uh, that on the production and the innovation economy. And I think the heartening thing from that whole piece of research is that there is uh, hope for manufacturing and that there are actually interventions and as I said, this was a very MIT approach of men's et manis, taking frontline research and Professor Berger's expertise and then turning it into something very concrete, manis leading to manufacturing. Uh, and it's very exciting to see the president, previous president having endorsed those manufacturing innovation initiatives. Um, with that, may I now turn to my other MIT professor here. And this is Professor Fiona Murray from the MIT Management School. Great. Well, thank you, Phil, and thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to talk to you today. Uh, I think in his work remarks yesterday, my colleague Scott Stern previewed some of the things that uh, he at least wanted me to talk about, and so I've tried to make sure that I fulfill the mandate that he provided for me yesterday. Um, so first, I just sort of want to go back, and I think as Suzanne has already done, and, and as our provost did yesterday, sort of do a little bit of definitional work. And this is not to say that we necessarily disagree with some of the other definitions that were provided, but rather to say these are the definitions that we're using in the work that we do. Um, when we created this innovation initiative for MIT, uh, my colleague Vladimir and I had to do quite a lot of work saying, well, if we have an innovation initiative, let us at least define innovation so we know what it is we're meant to be managing or organizing uh, or encouraging uh, at MIT and beyond. And so we do take this quite wide definition, I think, very much in the same spirit as uh, Professor Berger, and think about it as this process of taking ideas all the way from inception through to impact. That isn't to say that on campus we have to get all the way through to the impact piece, uh, but rather to say that is the trajectory that we want to put ideas on. And we are not confined in the way we think about that to ideas that are narrowly of the sorts of things that we only think about on campus of things that you might think of as technology in a more specific sense, uh, but rather there can be new innovations in business models, uh, technologies, processes, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, the other piece that I think is especially important in the work that we're doing collectively is really this focus as well on entrepreneurship. And so we think of entrepreneurship in probably a more narrow sense than some people who might think of entrepreneurial behavior, but rather entrepreneurship as the collection of activities that are involved in creating and growing new enterprises. And we take that definition quite seriously because we think that that's really an organizational definition. It basically argues that much of the entrepreneurial activity that's going to take place will happen in the context of these new to the world organizations that are going to be part of that entire innovation process. But we don't think that they are important alone or in and of themselves. That in fact, there are a range of stakeholders that are going to have to be invoked if we want to get ideas from that earlier stage all the way through to impact in the world. And so it may be that universities are involved, that startups are involved, that they have to work with large corporations, uh, they have to work with corporations involved in supply chains and manufacturing, but that the, there is a role for government uh, and for risk capital. And so there are a number of different organizational entities, and a lot of what we're worrying about is really the ways in which those different entities interact and work together effectively, both on a regional level, 
also at a national level and then across regions because I think what we increasingly see is that this innovation process tends to connect one region of the world to another uh, where each particular region has its own form of comparative advantage. Um, before I go on, I would also say that one of the inspirations behind this and this focus on entrepreneurship has really come from our students. And so we heard yesterday Manuel talking about uh, the young generation, um, unemployment and so on. And I think if you were sitting at MIT's campus in 2008, right after the financial crisis, although it's not a place where you think about unemployment, it was extremely hard for our students to find jobs. The students that were graduating for probably one of the first times in a very long time found that that investment that they'd made in extraordinary education didn't actually necessarily mean that they could walk out into the traditional jobs in consulting and banking as well as in big companies and so on. And so what we saw in that post-2008 period was actually a larger number of our students deciding to start companies and to become entrepreneurs. And even though the economy rebounded and the banks and the consultants and others came back to campus to recruit, um, it seemed to me that this, what was, had happened was actually a more important secular shift and that the students weren't necessarily changing their paths back to the more traditional ones. But in fact, we now find that of our graduating uh, of those students who graduate and are not going directly on to further education, almost 20% of them are joining venture-backed startups. That's a quite significant percentage when you think about it. And so it's also the case they're not always starting these companies, but they're certainly interested in being part of that different organizational model. As Suzanne said, we have a lot of startups that come straight out of MIT based on research in our laboratories, about 25 of those a year. There are probably another 100 or so that come, let me say, from the dorm room. It's not quite fair, but um, that are not directly connected to work in the laboratories. And we know from surveying our alumni that there are about 1,000 companies a year that get started by our alum. And so clearly, entrepreneurship is a vehicle that they see as an important piece of this puzzle. But we also see that this is not evenly distributed around the world. You've heard already from many people that uh, innovation is quite spiky and not evenly distributed. Uh, certainly, that's also true of entrepreneurship, particularly entrepreneurship that's really uh, um, involved in this innovation process and really moving <coughs> these ideas out into the economy through innovation-driven enterprises. And so a lot of the research that we've done collectively has been to try to understand what are those conditions that enable particular regions to actually be effective um, in particularly the early stages of that process. And so our approach to these innovation ecosystems is really threefold, and you saw a, a, a slightly brighter version of this image from Professor Stern yesterday. And so we think about understanding the system, the stakeholders, and then the strategies uh, that regions are taking or can take to really enhance their ability uh, to do innovation. So let me say something about the system, because I think that actually connects the dots between some of the work and the ideas that we heard yesterday, some of the discussion of clusters and so on. I think at the core, we think about foundational institutions. We've heard a little bit about the fact that things that we take for granted here in the Eurozone and elsewhere, uh, basic fundamental institutions, rule of law and certainty, are extremely important as, as things that just sort of allow for contracts and, and so on and so forth. We then think about certain places in the world having quite strong cluster-based comparative advantage. And so it's not that we see what we're doing in, as a counterpoint, in a sense, to the cluster orientation, but rather to say that's something about the current economic structure in a particular place. And on top of that, we see two really quite distinctive sorts of capacities that regions will have. And one is innovation capacity. This is an idea that is... Um, quite long-lived, people have thought about this for a long time, and that is the capacity to develop new to the world ideas and start to move them towards impact. What we wanted to think about is the fact that we see that as really quite separate from an entrepreneurial capacity, which is the capacity to create new to the world enterprises and to actually start to scale them up uh, so that they actually grow and engage in job creation and so forth. And what we see in the most vibrant uh, regions of the world is that they build on their foundations, their clusters, but actually have both ICAP, as we would call it in shorthand, and ECAP. They have two, those two things, and those things are connected. That those people engage in innovation, especially the earlier stages, whether it's in the sort of technological innovation, are actually part of and interact with those community of individuals who are also the entrepreneurs. That these are not two separate worlds, that those worlds are actually connected together. When those worlds connect together, we see the development of what 
um, Scott talked about yesterday, these innovation-driven enterprises that skew distribution, those companies at the high end of the distribution that have potential to have really significant growth and economic outcomes. And obviously that leads to a variety of forms of impact, economic impact, social progress, and, and so on. And so that's really the system that we think about and we want to ask the question, how does one intervene in that system? Where are the points of leverage that we have? One thing that I think is worth saying that is very key to our model is that it's very easy to step back and talk about a system in the abstract, but we actually observe that these systems only work well when a whole range of key stakeholders, individuals of human agents are actually involved and connected and talking to one another. There are lots of stories, particularly stories of places like Silicon Valley, which will be stories all about the entrepreneur. Uh, if you come to Kendall Square and if you talk to people at MIT on the wrong day, they'll tell you it's all about MIT. Uh, on the right day, I think we remind you that it's actually about everybody uh, being engaged. There's a role for risk capital providers. Um, there is a role for very large corporations, and I think Suzanne pr articulated that well in terms of providing a lot of the complementary assets and some of the traditional uh, assets and manufacturing and so on. But there's also a role for government. And so I think this is a, 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 a rather different view than a view that you sometimes hear in some of the classic US narrative that the government should basically get out of the way. But in fact, the government, I think, plays a quite strong and purposeful role in bringing stakeholders together and in providing uh, some of the conditions for action. And what we see in some of these most uh, well-functioning innovation ecosystems is that these stakeholders actually know one another and come together and engage with one another. The third piece that we think about is really the strategic piece, which is to say, you can do some of the sort of setting of the table of creating the underlying institutional conditions for these ecosystems, but in fact it's about some quite clearly defined policy and program interventions that are really the things that are going to make the difference in starting to accelerate um, innovation-driven entrepreneurship and accelerate the effectiveness of these particular regions, accelerating the ways in which people and resources come together to actually um, be effective. Now, I think on the policy side, we've already heard that you know, innovation policy and entrepreneurship policy, frankly, is a complicated object. Um, somebody mentioned yesterday that you know, we, need a, we need to have some simple things for policymakers and politicians to understand. I think the challenge of innovation is that innovation policy is actually in the remit of many different government departments and many different agencies. You can't sort of put it all in one place and say, do these one or two things and everything will be fine. There's, um, many different policy levers that I think need to be pulled at some point simultaneously and in particular ways that allow the innovation capacity and the entrepreneurial capacity to be, uh, to have an effective policy foundation. Uh, there's a long list that I won't go through, but somebody, I, th I think Greta earlier mentioned uh, visas. Uh, certainly on the innovation side, the ability to make sure that you have the right talent, having the right sorts of mobility, coming to the right places at the right time is critical. Similarly with entrepreneurship, having the entrepreneur's visa as we do in, as we have in the UK and other countries, I think can be extremely uh, critical. In terms of taxes, whilst I think it's the case that you can have high tax regimes that can still have lots of entrepreneurship. We know that specific interventions like capital gains tax on angel investing and early stage investments can be really critical to driving capital into some of the earlier stages of certain companies. Things like bankruptcy rules and ease of doing business obviously all matter. So there's a sort of set of, I think quite complicated, but fairly clearly articulated pieces of innovation policy that I think we can define and for which we have growing uh, evidence. But it's really the program piece I want to talk about because that, I think, is where we can take action and we can actually see results in the more short term. And so it's really with that in mind that our Regional Entrepreneurship Acceleration Program brings regions together to help them think through um, both the system that they have and come to some shared agreement of what the strengths and weaknesses are in their system, to come together as stakeholders so that they actually talk to one another, and then to create these strategic priorities so that you have a prioritized ability to move forward with strategic actions that are really relevant to your region. And it really is in that priority setting an understanding of your comparative advantage that I think the cluster work becomes really powerful and helpful to say, what are the specific areas in the economy? What are the assets in my economy that I want to build on where I think I have the opportunity for some sort of comparative advantage? And so we bring regions together to basically engage in this shared learning, to come to a shared perspective on where their system is, its strengths and weaknesses, and what they do. 
And so our theory of change gets reflected in this particular program, which Scott referred to yesterday, where we work with regions over about a two-year period to go through the frameworks, the strategy building, and then really the implementation. And this is all about, this is not about MIT coming and saying, you should do this. It's actually coming and being a thought partner and saying, well, how do you understand your data? What do you think is your comparative advantage? And then can we help you in that implementation? As part of the implementation, particularly for programs, I would say that we have to build on two things. So we have to build on the science of innovation, as you've heard, what the evidence is, but we also have to build on the art. There's a sort of an art and a science to this, in part because our knowledge is not actually sufficiently robust for us to say, if you do this under these conditions, the following three things will happen. Our actual knowledge of this is, is not sufficiently reliable for us. So in, in some ways, we're at the opposite end of the problem from the sort of total factor productivity discussions that Manuel had yesterday, where we can measure everything into oblivion, and we're not quite sure what to do with that. In this case, at the program bottom-up level, we're not quite sure always how to measure it. We haven't done that many systematic studies. Uh, and so we're actually having to, to build up from what makes sense and what we observe from lots of examples. But let me say something about what we see as the, as the effective sort of elements of an effective program. Typically, these programs are going to be time bounded and they're going to be um, designed to enhance a particular area of strength or overcome a particular challenge. They do tend to build on comparative advantage. And I think if there's one thing that's important about these kinds of programs is they generally link and engage more than one stakeholder group. So things that are done across different stakeholder groups tend to be more effective than others. Uh, let me give you an example that is close to home. So one of the observations that we've made at MIT is that our hard tech, our tough tech uh, hardware-based companies actually don't have the time, the capital, and the resources that they need to really develop and the time frames that tend to match the sort of venture capital that floats about. And so part of, uh, we've created a new program called The Engine. And one of the key pieces here is to actually link those entrepreneurs back to some of the highly specialized infrastructure and equipment on campus. So that's a fairly specific program which comes with some fairly specific sorts of capital as well as infrastructure. So we're linking the, the entrepreneurs back to the universities to help give them the ability to translate those ideas more rapidly. Let me give you another example. So uh, the Kaufman um, Foundation for a long time had some Kaufman Fellows which basically uh, gave PhD scientists and engineers the opportunity work to work in the venture capital space for a period of time. One of the things that I think that did is it connected the universities and technical talent into the risk capital community. So it's a different bridge, but it was a bridge that meant that over time the risk capital community, particularly in the US, became highly uh, technical in its expertise, which made it much easier for them to then invest in these really uh, deep science oriented companies. So that's another form of linkage. We've been working recently with Singapore, who have a challenge of the fact that much of their top talent is sort of stuck inside the government. And so we've been helping them design a program that actually bridges the gap between government and entrepreneurship and says, if you want to pay back your country for your educational scholarships, don't work for the government, be an entrepreneur. That's meant to send both a cultural signal, but also to, again, bridge the gap of the people in the ecosystem. And so we're continually thinking about program design in terms of the bridges that they can build across the different parts of the stakeholder ecosystem. Let me just say that the last piece is that if we do this and we never measure anything, then I think we are not developing the science of innovation in the way that we should. And so we need to evaluate program effectiveness as we go along. And while we need ecosystem level metrics as the, of the form that we discussed on the panel yesterday, we also need to get really good, I think, at program evaluation. There's a lot of expertise in this around doing things like randomized controlled experiments and so on, but really just think about this as us needing to do clinical trials on the kinds of programs that we design. And when we do this, we need to have the discipline to actually engage in this. This requires some bravery because you have to be willing to be able to find that your program actually didn't have an effect, or at least not an effect that's measurable. But I think it's extremely important. And so let me just end with one example of us having done this for an accelerator program in Boston called Mass Challenge uh, that takes about 120 something companies every year into a classic sort of three to four month mentor based program of acceleration. 
Uh, I'm going to spare you the regression tables in the interest of time um, and simply show you the scatter plots. So imagine on the x-axis, basically what I've done is you kind of line up all the companies that are apply and I can judge them and I can give them a judging score. And what you'll see if you just looked along the x-axis is those scores are basically continuous. And so between the companies I chose and the companies I didn't, those ones on the margins are basically the same. And I picked that arbitrary cutoff where that line is in the middle of 128 because that's the number that Mass Challenge choose to take every year. On the y-axis, you can basically see the funding outcomes for these companies. And so it's the ones that are on your top right-hand side that actually were in the program who got the accelerated treatment compared to the ones that were not. And so what that basically shows us is that, in fact, in this case, in that program, there really is a measurable demonstrative effect in terms of jobs, um, funding outcomes, and so on. That requires, in this case, an entire PhD student's worth of effort to actually do this analysis in a rigorous and serious way. But as we get better at doing that, I think we really have the opportunity to build up our science of innovation and science of programs in a way that I think is going to mean that our ecosystems are going to be uh, benefited by these kinds of programs in a more systematic fashion. So, thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you to both uh, professors. In fact, I think the provost of MIT who was here yesterday who oversees political science and management would be delighted that we have two uh, such professors here. Just listening to you both today, what I love about this is the MIT approach of men's at Manus. Not only have you done the deep research and understanding of these fields, but you then try to apply it in the real world. I'm also struck that you both take as your unit of analysis the ecosystem. So I wonder if I could just ask you uh, both a quick question. Um, this seems to be a different approach than just a, a firm level analysis or a national economy level analysis or even a cluster analysis. Um, how much of a challenge is it or a novelty to use the ecosystem as a unit of analysis? And then what have been the challenges of actually taking forward these particular programmatic interventions? In the first case, the, uh, the manufacturing innovation initiatives on Professor Berger's side and then on Professor Murray's side, ap applying REAP. And are these things that we think we might be able to use here in, in Europe? I think when we uh, are looking at the ecosystem, we're looking at the, uh, at the resources that are available uh, to firms as they, uh, as they attempt to uh, create, create value. So that uh, when, for example, I uh, would be interviewing one of the Ohio metalworking firms that fell into our Main Street sample, uh, I would, uh, and when I would ask them, when you have uh, a new idea, for example, about uh, not simply making the uh, metal boilers that three generations of your family have been making in this company, but now you're, uh, you're, you're actually talking about working on, uh, uh, on projects where you'll be bringing uh, types of metal that you've used in construction into the defense industry, uh, where do you actually find the skilled people you need to do this? Where do you find the capital that you need to uh, build new plants? Uh, where do you get the skills that you don't have in your company? And at each point of that, in, in that interview, uh, I was constantly trying to understand what was it that the, that the company had uh, in their existing resources and where potentially in the environment, in the, within the range uh, that they might actually access, could they find the missing pieces? And the missing pieces here were missing pieces of skill, missing, missing capital, missing expertise and skills that were not available within the firm. And I think as we sat down then to do the analysis of the ecosystem and compared uh, the situation of this Ohio company with a quite comparable, in some ways, uh, company that we had interviewed in, in Germany. The German firm that we had in mind as a sort of match was also working in metalworking and was actually making machine tools. And the machine tool manufacturer in Germany told us that most of his ma machine tools were being made for the auto industry. And as he was thinking about the auto industry, he came to feel that he was kind of vulnerable 
or too vulnerable to fluctuations in the automobile industry and that he wanted to sort of branch out. So he went to a trade fair and he observed that there were machine tool makers who were working on um, making machine tools for, for artificial hips. And he, so he began to realize that what he was seeing there in the trade fair uh, those it wasn't so different from some of the machine tool technologies that he was using in the auto industry. So he started experimenting within his own company on what they might do to make machine tools for, for artificial limbs, for, for knees. Uh, and he was able to go to a technical university uh, close to the company and get some help from them. He was able to go to a local banker who had known three generations of his family he was able to borrow from the local bank. As I mentioned, no local banks anymore in the United States. He was able to go to a, 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 a Fraunhofer Institute nearby, get some help from them. He was able to join a German government uh, financed research consortia on medical devices. So there was, a, a, in his environment, there was an extraordinary diversity of public goods, or you could say uh, semi-public goods, that he could join with the resources that he had in his own firm. Whereas our American guy was home alone. He basically was able to use only the resources that he had in his own pocket. He wasn't even able really to use the R&D credits that our tax system offers because the definition of R&D and innovation in the United States is so narrow uh, that uh, it's really totally unavailable to to, to, to your ordinary company. So I, I think we had a kind of functional definition of ecosystem, uh, which uh, amounted to the kinds of resources that were available on a semi-public basis that co company individuals and companies could join with what they themselves had in pocket. Excellent, thank you very much. Sure. I mean, I think the idea of a regional ecosystem, on the one hand, we've been inspired by some of the work on clusters that really is, is done at the sort of nuts to level kind of analysis. But it's also um, something that I think are these boundaries that rather naturally emerge when you ask people, how far do you reach to get the sorts of resources and the people and the circulation of ideas and talent and, and, and resources that you actually want? And typically that happens in a way that can be quite hard to define because it doesn't always map neatly to political boundaries. I think perhaps Silicon Valley is one of the best examples is that there is no such, there's, no, there's really no place. It's just been defined as such. Um, there's no mayor of Silicon Valley, as Phil likes to remind our students. Um, there's no sort of particular landmark that says this is where it is. It, it, it has become, if you like, a sort of a natural evolving boundary around that. And the same, I think, with Greater Boston. Well, we really think about it as Kendall Square, but if you came to visit, you'd see that it sort of bleeds out over time uh, to some natural boundaries. Occasionally, it's more straightforward. A place like Singapore, you might think of as a quite nicely self-contained ecosystem. It's a country, it's a city-state, it seems to be about the scale. And so I'm not sure that we're as scientific as, as we might like to be about where those boundaries really lie. It is about the sort of the natural boundaries uh, that the innovators and entrepreneurs uh, sort of place around the activities that they do. Phil, you also mentioned some of the implementation challenges, I think, and, and I think our two other speakers can, can really speak to that. My, my own experience is that, particularly for the types of activities that we're talking about, uh, these sort of program interventions, of which the manufacturing institutes, I think, would be one, is that you do have to get engagement across multiple stakeholder groups. And I think that's easy to say and remarkably difficult to actually do meaningfully to sustain that engagement in practice over the long run. I think it's also hard because what people really want is to say, which program should we do? Show me one and I'm going to cut and paste and replicate that. And the reality is, is that each ecosystem has its own particular underlying conditions that means that your, the right intervention is going to be different in each case. And so I think that's a very hard thing because you can't always build on precedent in a narrow sense. And lastly, we don't have enough evidence. And so we, at the same time as we're implementing a program, we really need to implement the evidence building capability as well and the program evaluation. And I think that requires a level of discipline and commitment to the implementation that is hard to do uh, and to really have that political uh, will to do that as well. So those are the three things that I think are challenging in implementation. 
Well, thank you, both professors, for those very learned answers as well. Let's have a look. Oh, we'll now move to the next slides. One of the things that really strikes me, having picked up on yesterday's conversation, is how little this approach to ecosystems and dealing with specific companies relies on you know, national percentages of funding in, in R&D. And uh, last night we heard about not making GDP uh, our, our divine inspiration and not sacrificing people and livelihoods on the altar of GDP. I'm also struck with the implementation of innovation, how often it's not just about calling for more, a greater percentage of GDP to be spent on R&D. It's like uh, people calling for a greater percentage just to be spent on defense. You know, there's, there may be magic in the numbers, but it's also what you do on the ground, which is a nice segue now to our two practitioners from our professors. And I'm gonna go to Donna first. She represents the Highlands and Islands region of Northern Scotland, which uh, for those of you who follow Eurostat, is a NUTS2 region of the NUTS1 region of the United Kingdom. And I believe Scotland is still part of the United Kingdom as I speak this morning, although things are moving quickly. You couldn't resist uh, it, could you, Bill? You just couldn't. So with that, <laughs> and, I am, and I am delighted, it's part of it. I, of course, I say that with some humility as a Brit wake, waiting for a text to find out if my country is taking itself out of the European Union. Uh, with that, let's go to the happier topic of how do you take these MIT insights into manufacturing, into production in the innovation economy, into the regional entrepreneurship acceleration program. How do you take that into the region that you care about? Donna. Thank you. Um, what I'm going to speak about over the next 10 minutes, essentially, is patient policy making. Um, what I mean by that is um, I'm going to speak about what we have done in Scotland to boost our ecosystem over the past five years. And in particular, I want to draw on Fiona's points around the connection between innovation capacity and entrepreneurial capacity. And this, for Scotland, is a whole system endeavour. Scotland, of course, has a long history of producing innovators and adventurers who have over centuries gone elsewhere in the world to commercialise and to exploit their ideas. And now in the 21st century, Scotland has 19 public universities and actually has the fifth highest spend in the OECD on higher education R&D but yet, similar to many advanced economies, continues to struggle to, uh, ooh, I've been boosted, um, <laughs> continues to struggle to uh, use this knowledge to underpin world-class businesses. So the, the Scottish economy is relatively mature and actually has been reasonably comfortable over a long period of time, and actually this can lead to a degree of inertia. Inertia is a, is a very negative thing in, in, in terms of innovation and in pushing forward. Um, it, what, so what does it take in that context to create outstanding entrepreneurs and an ecosystem that they need to launch and to scale innovation-driven enterprises, or IDEs, as Fiona has spoken about? So small countries, small places like Scotland don't have deep pockets. We can't publicly fund large amounts of basic or fundamental research and wait for decades to see what happens. In an ecosystem, um, we have to exploit relatively close to market research. We have to collaborate. We need every single person in the system to draw on some of what Manuel said yesterday. We have to draw the knowledge to us and we also have to focus tightly on exploiting opportunities. We have to be agile and we have to use our comparative advantage. So four years ago, um, as a first step in uniting the innovation ecosystem, we established our innovation centres to draw together in one place um, academia, business, corporates and government around major industrial challenges, global challenges, where Scotland has a contribution to make. I want to mention two of those innovation centres particularly, the Scottish Aquacultural Innovation Centre, or SAIC, and the Industrial Biotechnology <coughs> Innovation Centre, or IBIOC. Both of these innovation centres were created by business and academia together with government and under industry-driven boards inside universities. Their purpose, their focus, their outcomes have all been driven by industry challenge, by customer need, by stimulating the market. What, really, what has really started to drive results four years into these innovation centres has actually been the quality of the leadership, the human capital, the connectivity between people. 
Um, and it goes back to an earlier point made that people know each other in a small environment. People know they have to work together and also draw in international expertise where needed. <coughs> There's also a tremendous amount of collaborative spirit in all of this and a willingness on behalf of all parts of the ecosystem to pull together. In response to that industry demand, most recently my organisation, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, announced an additional million pounds of R&D funding with business to leverage and stimulate greater demand to focus on new technologies, particularly in the aquaculture supply chain, which is a big sector in Scotland. And these funds will be managed by government with the Innovation Centre and matched by industry cash using, of course, our dear friends, um, State Aid Articles 25 to 29. We never go away from State Aid. It's always there lurking in the background. What is important with these funds is that they will be used across industrial sectors. So they'll be used from logistics to sensors to software to packaging. It doesn't matter which sector the technology or the information comes from. What matters is that it improves industrial productivity in a specific sector. It's blooding the edges and drawing together the technologies for a new application. In industrial biotechnology, we have substantial international business players located in Scotland. We have excellent research in marine agricultural and health related areas and there is also a circular economy push on reducing waste particularly food waste which actually stimulates new products and services and we want these innovation centers to be right at the heart of that where iBioC perhaps perhaps has some advantages is actually in the coalescence of Scotland's deep research pool in this field with economic development agencies such as my own at the table we are part of the board and businesses of scale to capitalise on these technologies. But it's the close connectivity between innovation and entrepreneurs, the frictionless motion of ideas, money and people that really matters. In 2014, Scotland published our REAP strategy. Having completed the Regional Entrepreneurship Acceleration Programme, Scotland was the first region or nation to be accepted onto the REAP programme following years of entrepreneurship teaching in Scotland by MIT. The exchange of ideas with the MIT faculty and our peers on the regional entrepreneurship programme were of critical importance. In the first cohort of REAP, we had New Zealand and Finland and Andalusia from Spain, as well as other regions such as Hangzhou from China. And this stimulating debate and exchange of ideas was actually very important to Scotland. Through REAP, we recognised that parts of our ecosystem needed to change, and it could very easily take at least 10 years to deal and to shift with the cultural issues. To paraphrase, um, our culture, in Scottish culture, could very easily have eaten our REAP strategy for breakfast. It really didn't matter. Every part of the ecosystem in Scotland has to work effectively to enable entrepreneurial teams and intrapreneurial teams to build and to sustain IDEs. And you can see Scotland's REAP strategy online. In executing it, we looked firstly at a series of programmes that we could put into the system which would build on what we had but actually take us further and faster. The first of those was in early stage finance. Together, the private and the public sector launched the Scottish Edge, a seed funding competition using government and corporate money. Now in round 10, the Scottish Edge has now awarded over £8 million as a combination of private and public sector money to a wealth of young companies. The Royal Bank of Scotland actually has provided a large part of the cash and there are other private sector partners in there pulling more ambitious businesses through the system and enabling them to be financed and to um, gain not just from the public sector financing with private sector but also the, the wealth of experience that sits in some corporates in Scotland. To address business confidence and closed networking, Entrepreneurial Scotland emerged as a private sector network for seriously ambitious entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs and innovators. And it has now over 600 international members. And they, for example, provide mentoring and non-executive director functions for growing enterprises. The third thing we did to address the quality of entrepreneurial skill was to launch what we call the Scotland Can Do Scale programme, a summer school for entrepreneurs whose businesses already have market traction. 
So these companies are already growing. So this is about the quality of entrepreneurship, the international perspective, and where they go next. The teaching for scale has been provided by Bill O'Let from MIT and Noam Wasserman, initially from Harvard. We now have put 130 very ambitious entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs through Scotland Can Do Scale, and we have another 70 coming this summer. The competition for these places is fierce, and what it has done is it's raised the game of entrepreneurship, the visibility, the ability of entrepreneurs to feel that they can be part of something this dynamic and energetic. The positive energy has been really refreshing and great to see. And the other thing it's done is to foster a culture of celebration in Scotland. Celebration of success, celebration of opportunity, but also acceptance and recognition of failure um, it, it, as a way to actually build and to move on. It's very important um, in Scottish culture to be able to see the benefits of both. So we now have over 100 very um, ambitious entrepreneurs that have gone through also through um, MIT's Entrepreneurship Development Programme. The return on investment from that has been astonishing in Scotland. Entrepreneurs find the can-do environment in Boston and the positive business culture really invigorating. But we take this back to Scotland. We're not trying to replicate it. We want to do it, but we want to, to work in a truly Scottish way um, and to build our system in a way that works for us. We have searched Europe for executive education of the quality and relevance that MIT produce through EDP, but we haven't been able to find it. And that in itself is a, is a statement. There, and there is much, much more to come from Scotland. REAP is at least a 10-year journey for us, and it's a 10-year journey in, in patient policy making and the execution of that. We've just recommissioned our research called the Global Entrepreneurship Development Index, or JEDI, as we like to call it, um, which assesses our entrepreneurial system performance three years into our journey. The, the difficulty with a lot of metrics is they're backward looking, and we're looking forward. And so the way that we measure what's happening is actually what's happening with our people and the results of, of, of what we're, we're investing in uh, and, and how that feels uh, across the ecosystem. So what, what difference has all this made to the energy and the focus of what we're doing? I think the REAP team took from, from, from the programme that what matters in Scotland is the connectivity, the connection of everything together and the focus, focus, focus over very long periods of time. The early signs are very positive for us. The number of innovation-driven enterprises um, or innovation-active businesses is increasing rapidly um, and the diffusion of innovation across the system is evident to see. The test will be whether the system is ready to help a number of these innovation-driven enterprises to scale. Um, already in Scotland recently, we saw our first two of these mythical unicorns um, be sold, which actually has some negative sides, but very positive sides as well. In unicorns being sold, there is a, a recycling of that talent and of that money back through the system in Scotland. The importance of the informatics centre at the University of Edinburgh has been absolutely critical in the ongoing creation and, and sustaining of talent and, and, and knowledge. The next challenge for us is to actually turn our attention to healthcare, um, because in the healthcare system in Scotland, we have a great combination of innovators leading the public sector health service we, as a major customer. And that's a different view for us in viewing the health service as the consumer, as the customer for business. Um, we have some innovative procurement tools we're currently experimenting with and working with. And we now have a series of very capable entrepreneurs in the informatics and information management and e-health sectors. We also have 50 years of great data. So let's see where the next yet six to 10 years takes us. We have an appetite for change and we're still experimenting. Excellent. Thank you very much, Donna, for that perspective from Scotland. And I'm, and I'm reminded as we prepare the slides for Lourdes uh, how important it is that we have this uh, MIT research and, and expertise, but it takes human agents to actually make this happen. It's rather like the diffusion of technology. It may look from 30,000 feet that technology just diffuses. It actually takes human agents. It takes people to adopt the technology and to adapt it. And the same with the insights from MIT. It takes leaders who are actually gonna take it back to their regional ecosystems, adopt the frameworks, and then adapt them to very uh, 
to, to their very specific regional ecosystems. So having talked about Scotland in the very north of Europe, we'd now like to turn to Lourdes and Granada in the very south. Thank you, Phil. Thank you for, uh, to all of you for this opportunity. It's a pleasure to be here today. To be competitive, region must invest in innovation driven entrepreneurship. And one way to promote uh, this innovation is via Engage Technology Parks. PTS Granada is a technology park focused on health, broadly defined uh, to include biotech, uh, pharmaceutical, medical device, diagnostic, and digital health. The PTS Granada integrates four areas, business development and innovation. Uh, so it's uh, business development and innovation, uh, healthcare, um, research, and education. In the research area, PTS promotes initiative to foster basis translational and clinical research with state-of-the-art facilities. So uh, we have also a key player in the Andalusia, that is the Andalusian Biobank, which manage all the biological materials that are stored in the entire Andalusian public health system. In the healthcare area, PTS Granada offer a brand new hospital with 700 beds, and the Andalusia Electronic Medical Record, the EMR, and the e prescribing system currently compromise more than 8 million uh, records and connect the majority of the region public primary care facilities as well as all pharmacies. In the education area, PTS hosts the Faculty of Medicine and the University of Health Science, which complements the existing advanced multifunctional center for simulation and technological uh, innovation and this uh, almost 10,000 MDs and medical professionals have participated at this center in the last five years. So what we are doing now is that the PTS leverage the increasing human capital in the region that currently includes more than 5,000 uh, students in the health area. So empowered by this MIT Regional Entrepreneurial Acceleration Program, the MIT REAP, the PTS Granada aims to continue fostering innovation-driven entrepreneurship. As a result of that, in 2016, uh, the European Commission has green light activate a three-year loan project funded by the European Union to support innovation in a small and medium-sized enterprise and foster the smart reindustrialization of Europe. Granada uh, Health Technology Park, PTS Granada, will be one of the key participants in this project, participating as a health-related cluster organization. PTS brings together a group of innovation-driven enterprise in the sector, for exploring, defining, and developing innovative application and service for new cross-sector and cross-border value chains. And PTS Granada is leading this large-scale demonstrator validation and impact assessment aiming at testing the feasibility uh, of the innovation strategies proposed by the project. So we hope that in the, sense, uh, in the next two years, we will be successful during the implementation and that you hear from us as a sound example of European cross-border and smart reindustrialization and accelerating economic development and job creation through effective enhancing innovation-driven entrepreneurial ecosystem. But let's give me a very specific example of what is going on in Granada, because that is a, 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 what is happening now. No? If we do a research, um, we see how, I mean, of course, uh, I want to say that uh, mm, the park, the health park is, located just outside Granada, and that is a beautiful city with 500 years of university history, and a long tradition in healthcare, biomedicine, and life science, and a flourishing entrepreneurial ecosystem with innovative capacity. We have the PhD, we have the research, we have the infrastructure, all of that. But we have 4% of national scientific production, that is pretty good, because our, uh, our territory is just 
2.5%, the population is almost 2%, but the GDP, again, is 1.4. So that is a paradox. So having so much national, national scientific production that we have so little GDP. So what is happening? So if we do a research, and we research uh, 25,000 articles in four years, and in six uh, major journals, and we have a, we find that just one or one article have a possible human clinical application. And ten years later, just ten, uh, just ten years later, so imagine, five were in licensed clinical use. So, and of these five, just one and only one have a major impact on current medical practice. So, how we go from basic to clinical research? How we go? How we are able? To, to, to solve this patient need, this doctor needs. Uh, and I use this joke, you know, that say, I think you should be more explicit here in step two, that is say, then a miracle of course. And that is what is going on, no? This is really a uh, difficult step because developing medicine, this, health, this sector health, is a long, risky, and expensive endeavor. And all of you know that take long, and take a lot of years from, uh, an, an idea to a registration in a FDA or in a European medic medicine agency. So what we try to use uh, or how we, we work with the people from MIT and trying to, uh, to look for the bottlenecks, but in a very specific way. You know? So we saw that there was problem in the discovery research, in the preclinical development, that there in the translational medicine, all of these parts have some bottlenecks. Um, I'm going to, uh, so the thing is that uh, we have a huge wave now here, and we cannot be lost in translation. We have to serve, because if not, it's, it's going to be a trouble. So we have these translational paradigms that if we try to look for uh, all these uh, clinical needs that the doctor have, that the patient have, we need, we need to identify very much where is the problem. If it's in the basic uh, part, is it in the translational or is it in the clinical? And if we do a survey to uh, a lot of uh, company, I just highlight the big pharma, I will say that uh, our main needs is to, uh, or what the, all of them think is that our main needs is to identify and validate relevant biomarkers to help us to sensibly decide if we should embark on big phase three clinical trials with cost million of euros to run. So we have to work on that. That is the bottleneck that is more important. So. Mm, seeing that, uh, we saw that there was a lot of uh, translational capabilities that are that they are working in academia and also in industry. So we have the basic research in academia and industry, and we have the patient care in academia, in the hospital, and the market and sales in the industry. And the pharmaceutical development in the industry is very small, but the clinical research in academia is pretty big. So we need to to look for this kind of uh, project management team that combine academia and industry. And that's, we are working the local, locally and it's working pretty well. Because once say, I don't know if I mentioned that, uh, that we have in the business development area, we have 74 innovative uh, or innovation driven enterprise and we have also big pharma, we have Merck, we have Abbott, we have Pfizer, we have also ICT companies like Telefonica for digital health. So what we are trying to do is a build this new pathway from lab to market and work in a how we can do this center for um, translational clinical research to attack and overcome each of these articles that the basic researcher face, the clinical researcher face, the translational researcher face. So we are working in, in translational or focus on translational enablement or implementation and will consist of helping to develop, coordinate, and integrate project management teams, as well as to provide human, core, and fiscal resource to ensure success of each translational project. So here we have a clinical research center that do all this complex first into human 
an early phase clinical uh, experiment. We have this clinical research lab that do all the uh, acquisition process, store and retrieve of human specimens from human to clinical trials. We have this translational research lab that focus on bed side to bench hypothesis driven experiments. So we are trying to to, to foster that. And we have the resource centers supporting us the translational project management teams that actually have the whole ecosystem. There is the government with the regulatory, the big pharma, the, that uh, they are combining and working with all the, um, all the protocols, how, how to go to the early phase clinical trials. And they have the entrepreneur, the entrepreneurial, uh, they have the, the uh, university, they have the whole ecosystem. And um, of course, we are working in the next generation because uh, uh, who is the one or, or how we are going to be able to, to train and mentor and establish uh, this collaborative community if we don't have this good role model of translational research. So uh, for us, uh, that's have been a, a challenging, uh, a, it's a challenge of course, but we are working on that and we also are trying to combine this with, a, with this European project uh, uh, about cluster and bridging, bridging all this innovation capacity with the entrepreneurial capacity. And that's it, I think. <laughs> If you have any question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now, I understand we have microphones. We've got a gentleman at the front who's ready. Uh, and while the microphone goes around there, one thing I would say is both Donna and Lourdes are very modest. They talk about their teams, they talk about their region, they talk about the ecosystem. But what is very clear from the REAP program is it takes a leader and a champion of these REAP teams to make a difference. And both Donna and Lourdes have been exemplary in leading their regional ecosystems. So, Diego. Hi, thank you. Um, Diego coming from Dartmouth. Um, I want to start by congratulating the panel. Uh, this probably has been one of the best panels I've seen in a long time. And of course, this is not just because of the value of the, of the individual pieces of the panel, but because I think the whole is greater than the sum of the individual parts. Um, it's been beautiful to see such a stark contrast between the models of innovation that Fiona and Suzanne have proposed. That was, you know, very clear to me, and, and, and I my question is about that, but before going to, to the question, I want to frame it in the context of the different evolution of manufacturing in the US and Germany that Susan was touching on. I think this is a very important question, not only because it's importance, intrinsic importance, but because of the things that it teaches us. Um, and so I think that Susan's analysis is very interesting. My, my view is, 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 is aligns with what Susan has highlighted, but with some small details of, of that discrepancy. So for example, I've studied this issue too, and I think that the role of human capital and human capital institutions is critical. So the vocational training schools in Germany is, is, is fundamental. Two thirds of the youth go there, and that provides a huge supply of semi-skilled uh, workers that we don't have in the US. Um, used to be on the job training, would be, would be the way to produce that in the US. Unfortunately, because of the rotation in jobs in the US, which is way higher than in Germany, companies in the US don't provide these trainings, while in Germany they do. Um, second important difference has to do with the focus of R&D. So R&D in the US goes to software, uh, electronics, and, and pharma. Uh, very easy to outsource. In Germany, it goes as, as you beautifully highlighted with your example of the of the of the machine um, company. You know, it goes to tools, to cars, to 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 you know precision machinery. That's very difficult to outsource. Requires this human capital. It fits into the local producers, so uh, jobs stay there. Finally, the role of the government is fundamental, but it's fundamental in a very sophisticated way. So if you tell me what's the key government institution in Germany, my, my answer is it's Fraunhofer. And the reason why it is, well, you know, it's the following. In an hour, I'm going to be presenting to the board of directors of Fraunhofer, a study I've been conducting for three years, evaluating the impact they have on German's productivities in the companies, the performance. The main finding is that sales of companies that interact with Fraunhofer 
casual, ca causally increases by nine percentage points after they engage in research contrast with Fraunhofer. And that's what ties to the issue of the innovation systems in the US and Germany. So the way that this model, um, but the way in which knowledge and innovation goes um, to the market in this model is the following. Um, companies are below the knowledge frontier. They would like to... Diego, are you building to a question? I'm, this is my question. This is, okay. my, this is my question. This is Sorry. the benefit of these smart academics. I'm so, I'm <laughs> now go on, finish your, finish your point, and then Professor Burke... It is interesting, <laughs> but I want to hear your answer back as well. Um, you know, as with innovation, you have to be patient, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so, um, the, the, I, the question has to do with the contrast, and so I, I, I want to highlight that contrast. That, that contrast. The, way, the way innovation knowledge goes to the economy in, 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 the, in, in this model that Susan was suggesting has to do with the fact that those that have the knowledge provide it to the companies, and then the companies continue doing their business. In contrast with the Silicon Valley model, what we are hoping is that the researchers, the innovators, become entrepreneurs, and they guess what the market needs. And then, in that process, hopefully they will get it right, and hopefully they will bring something to, to the economy. And that happens very, very rarely, and when it happens, probably happens for reasons that are not the ones that lead to the highest value for society. Like, you know, I, you know, I, I, my notion, you know, my, my, my sense is whether, you know, we should be hoping, you know, to produce the next fa Facebook and, and whether that is really what we should be aspiring to, you know, I guess that's the question, like, you know, and, and that's what I think that the Silicon Valley model produces. Excellent. Thank you very much. And can you pass the microphone to Manuel Trachtenberg, who will be our third questioner. Professor Berger, would you like to uh, respond to Diego? You want to collect questions? Sure, I'm happy to do so. There was a second person over there. So, uh, Fiona, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, tax actually might impact innovation. I would be really interested to hear a little bit more on that. Uh, I read a study last week from LSE uh, where they said even on a national level, the results were inconclusive. And I personally would argue that maybe we would need to increase the capital gains tax to compensate for the damage that some of the startups actually creates, like Uber and Airbnb that are exploiting a regulatory gap rather than innovative gap. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, on it comes to the, the, the meat of the uh, programs, like acceler accelerators and incubators, uh, I have another question on that. Uh, a German study on the Swedish incubators came out with, with similar results. They saw a higher likelihood of survival uh, based on if you were uh, partaking in the program or if you were not. Uh, however, based on the selection criteria of the incubator, I would suggest that that might be bias in a, in a sense. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, when I did my research interviewing the Swedish incubator managers, I found that 80% of them actively uh, avoid disruptive technologies, hence lowering the risk overall, and that while spending government money, basically. And, and what is your take on that, and how can we actually uh, allow for disruptive technology companies within the selection criteria? Excellent, thank you very much. Manuel. Yes, uh, uh, Fiona, um, I want to say that the RIP uh, project is unique in, in my, uh, actually, in my knowledge in the sense that uh, uh, this is something that is an intervention that is designed to have an impact, but also to study, to develop the science of innovation. And we don't have many opportunities in the social sciences and economics to do things like that, so it's a fantastic thing now. But I didn't quite get what's the placebo here. I mean, what's the control group? Do you have a control group to which you co can compare the, the effectiveness of the, of the project? Second question, the same uh, vein. Um, you have a particular model of what a, a region is and how to intervene, but you need some mutations because you know that that's not the only way to go about it. And perhaps you need some a virtual region, quote unquote, uh, of virtual uh, stakeholders and so forth, and try that out uh, as well in your next version to Suzanne. Uh, you talk about the, the, the fragmentation of industry and, and the fact that you know, all these traditional vertically integrated uh, corporations have vanished. 
and the, there are these holes. But on the other hand, you have the Googles and the Amazons and so forth, which are incredibly integrated okay, in their own terms, and they do have enormous capabilities to do not everything but a great deal, not inside in a location, but within the confines of the film. So you have this dual phenomena. Uh, I would like you to comment uh, on that. I have one word about uh, Donna. I commend the fact that you stressed, emphasized, the fact that the visibility competition uh, for this program a celebration of both success and risk-taking. These are critical things that we don't pay enough attention to them. Thank you very much. I saw a fourth question, so we'll take that and we'll give the panel a chance to come back and answer these. Thank you. Uh, this is Enrique with MIT. Um, talking about uh, clusters and also these efforts of uh, REAP regions, how do you know when a region ignites? And, and how do you measure it? Very good questions. So with that, um, I think Professor Berger, the first question may have been started with you. So if you'd like to come back on any of those. Yeah, I would take the question that Diego asked and, and that you asked. I mean, I, I think the German model is really a challenging one for us to think about. And what, uh, because it really suggests that manufacturing can have a very significant role in an advanced industrial country. If you look at, um, how economists in the United States have looked at the German success, they've really largely dismissed it as a, uh, as a kind of effect of an uh, overstrong, <laughs> overstrong uh, 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 euro, which has given a strong advantage uh, to uh, German manufacturing. So that uh, the actual fact that Germany still has something like 20% of its workforce employed in manufacturing is seen as a kind of artifact, an artificial uh, uh, derivative of, uh, of, uh, of a strong euro, which is allowed uh, in a, 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 which is allowed an even stronger uh, mark to, um, uh, in fact, have an export uh, capability that it would not have had if the mark had had to make it in its, uh, it make its way in the world alone. Uh, the uh, consensus view of I would say American mainstream economists has been that the disappearance of manufacturing in the United States, like the disappearance of agriculture, is a kind of natural, uh, is a kind of natural phenomenon. In the United States in 1900, we needed 40% of the workforce uh, employed in agriculture to feed the rest of us. Uh, today, we need less than 2% of the population in manufacturing also. It's uh, imagined that uh, you know, we might have needed a large manufacturing workforce in the past, uh, today we really don't need that amount of people. And I think uh, if we focus uniquely on monetary phenomena, we really don't understand uh, the role that manufacturing plays in Germany and what the disappearance of manufacturing has meant in the United States for our ability to scale up from innovation into, in, into actual commercialization. It doesn't allow us to understand our deficit uh, on, uh, on tradable, in, in tradable goods. So the challenges that you've raised, Diego, I think are really serious ones for our understanding, and we really have not, I think, begun to fully understand the impact, uh, the impact of the differences uh, between, the two, between the two countries. On your question, um, uh, don't we actually see the rebirth today of a, kind, a certain kind of vertically integrated uh, company? I think it, it, it could well be um, that over the last five years, uh, as we've seen Google and Amazon, these other com companies that started as almost uniquely uh, limited to software, as they've begun to move into uh, cars and drones and other things that actually require producing hardware, it does look as if we are again uh, looking at something like the rebirth of vertically integrated companies. What's kind of interesting about these companies, and you can see it, uh, is that they are protected by very large cash reserves. You can see something like Apple uh, against financial market pressures. And uh, it's fascinating to me uh, how the unicorns and a number of even super unicorns are today resisting a moving, public, moving into public offerings exactly as a way of protecting themselves against the pressures 
uh, that other companies have, have, uh, have experienced from, in fact, being publicly listed companies. Uh, if we just look, however, at the last 30 years and leave the last five out of, out of consideration, what's really interesting is that all of the new big companies over a 30-year period in the United States, whether Cisco or Qualcomm or Apple or the others, have been companies that, in, in fact, uh, uh, had no production capabilities. I think we're seeing perhaps the beginning of something new there and, and something quite interesting. Excellent. Thank you very much. Professor Murray. So let me see if I can remember all the questions. Um, let me say just something about tax policy. So I think it's really difficult to think about this in the broad sense of, of sort of tax policy or taxation rate and ask what that's doing for a much more specific set of activities around entrepreneurship and innovation. I think there's some quite compelling evidence that the changes in capital gains for very early stage investment, especially angel investments, has certainly led to a takeoff in the amount of angel and seed stage investment in risky things, particularly certainly in the UK when they change those policies. So I think there's some quite reasonable evidence that that's true. Um, if you look at a different piece of regulation that I'm not sure we'd really call tax regulation, but it's certainly around how money flows, something like the prudent man laws and rules that were put into place was the thing that allowed a lot of institutional investment to go into venture capital in the early stages in the US. So I think that there's some evidence there. Should we um, argue for increased taxes? Because sometimes when we have early stage companies and, and these in innovation driven enterprises, they behave in ways that we don't like and they take advantage of regulatory loopholes. I don't think that increasing taxes is the right solution to that. I think the solution to that is to think about the regulation that you want to place on taxi services and, and, and such like. So I, I don't think we should use the, the blunt instrument of taxation to solve some of the regulatory capture kind of behaviors of specific companies. I think that we should deal with that in a different way. So that would be my answer to the kind of Uber sort of piece of the question. Um, I think there's also some really interesting things that happen around taxes, around charitable giving and philanthropy that have caused um, different flows of capital and more patient capital into certain sectors where there are charitable and impact-oriented interests that I think are also quite interesting, more subtle ways of, of thinking about capital flows. Uh, to the question about accelerators, you know, how can we know? Obviously, if you actually just looked at everybody who was in an accelerator, just like if I looked at the outcomes of people who went to MIT and those that didn't, or people who went to any other excellent program, it's very, very difficult to separate the selection from the treatment effect. And so what we did specifically in our study is actually look at the margin between the people who just got in and the people who just didn't on the basis that if you actually looked at the scores and the way the judges understood those, those they were basically identical. And so we're using a, a method called regression discontinuity just to look at that margin. Obviously the people that were the, the shoe in because they were fantastic, they were gonna do really well anyway. And so we try to be very, very careful when we do this analysis to make sure that uh, we are actually picking up an effect in a meaningful way, not just, oh, I was really good at choosing. Um, I think that every accelerator is different, and so it's when you want to think about whether or not you are taking in or not taking in disruptive and, and high growth potential businesses, we have to look at what the selection criteria are and what the incentives are of the people running the program. A mass Challenge, for example, is not for profit, and so I think they have an ability to make different sets of choices. Um, they're not government funded, at least today. Uh, Manuel, you asked a similar question, but in a broader sense. Uh, so we do not have placebo regions. Um, there are regions who haven't taken the program. Um, I think that the program is sufficiently messy, for want of a better word, in the specifics of the people involved at the particular moment that it's really difficult at the moment, I think, for us to really understand the impact at a pure regional level. It's much easier for us to get a bit more serious about the impact of specific programs. I think your idea of... So mutation, I think, happens because we are not suggesting a specific solution that's gonna be the same in every case. And so in, ev in some senses, every single region is doing something different that allows us to look at solutions that we believe take into account the specificity of the particular situation. It would be just like my saying, Fraunhofer is great, 
let's cut and paste that and put it in the UK and call it a catapult. Well, because the entire UK industrial economy and structure and apprenticeships and industry structure is different, then I would argue the Fraunhofer model, if you cut and pasted it, simply wouldn't work. And so I see every in interaction and every region in, in some ways as its own mutation. But the idea of a sort of synthetic region, I think we could do a lot with that. And we could do a lot with the sort of modeling um, that we would to help us think through that so that we could be a bit more thoughtful and systematic. So I, that's a, I appreciate that comment. Excellent. Thank you, for professors. I want to give the practitioners a chance to, to come in, and particularly as you're in regions, we weren't able to run a parallel Scotland or a sterile Granada and not treat them. <laughs> but um, how, does it, how does it feel to you to actually be in those regions and what are the impacts you see? Uh, certainly from my perspective, I would, I would um, echo what Fiona said there. It is very much a unique programme and, and certainly you go in using the stakeholder model uh, and looking at the ecosystem perspective, but you draw from that what's right for your part of the world and the issues are evident to the, to the team and the selection of the team that undertakes REAP is, is very carefully selected from each part of the ecosystem and that is there to reflect a different set of experiences, different set of opinions uh, and, and I suppose for us the, the beauty of the programme in many ways was the journey that these people go on over, over a number of years and out in, into the real world again to, to execute the strategy that develops because that shared experience creates a terms of reference that then spreads more widely through the system. And, and for us, that was probably the most powerful element of it, where you, you share a common language, a common taxonomy almost of, of what it is we're talking about. Um, and then through our um, experience, we shared that much more widely across a group of stakeholders, hundreds of people in the system, um, that then went further and further, and on it goes. So, so, so for us, it's the, the team in itself was simply the beginning, um, but the team was chosen very carefully not to present uh, similar views, because that's not the case. We all have very, very different views and different experiences. But with the MIT faculty and, and with our peers, we were able to... Um, build on a common set of experience that we could then apply and draw others in. But at the end of the day, it does take a certain type of person to be that receptive to that level of change. Um, because you, you have to be in a system that's ready for that, and it's to the point around ignition. And I'm not sure that ignition is necessarily the right word when you're dealing with something that takes years of mutation. Um, but, but I'd certainly like to think that uh, Scotland is to an extent igniting itself, and the catalyst in that has been the REAP programme. Claudius, did you like a chance to come in? I mean, in our case in Andalusia, I mean, for us, it was very helpful to have this framework and to do this overall assessment of all the capacities um, from the innovation point of view and from the entrepreneurial uh, point of view. So we, we research of the people, the funding, infrastructure, policy, rewards. And we were with this common language, and for instance, the demand, we saw that we have limited and not focused enough today. So we thought, you know, we have to work on that. But this is a long period. Uh, 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 I mean, we have to, to be patient, of course. Uh, and what, what we are doing right now is something, I mean, the, the first things that we are doing is measuring, measuring everything. Uh, in, I mean, Scott is also with his uh, work is helping us, and Fiona and Mercedes Delgado is the advisor of uh, of our um, is the scientific advisor in our European project uh, for this uh, European cluster collaboration platform. And for instance, now what that we are uh, researching is how to transfer or how to do this cross-border and cross-sector value, value chains and in four specific sector in health, aerospace, uh, agro-food, and ITC. Um, I mean, we are using all these tools and what we have now is, is, is a wonderful way to, to, to start to measuring everything, to, to predict the, the, how will be the quality of these companies. For instance, in the case of this European project, we have a, a, we, this project, the Activate project, will benefit Andalusia Entrepreneur in immediate and tangible way by providing direct funding, we give them 5,000 
euros. It's not a lot of money, but uh, it's a good uh, start. So how we do that is, uh, and also we, we have other business school uh, like ESA that is helping us for the mentorship and, and helping them how to, to have all these um, a structure um, have the status to be the best company, but uh, the call for us now, now, now we are in the process of uh, assessing and selecting the best companies is paramount. So how we measure and how we are uh, aware of that uh, the companies that we are picking are the best one, and that uh, for us was very helpful. All this experience with the uh, RIP team and all the work that is doing, the MIT, also we are also using the ESA work, but for us, for the framework was very, very important. Well, thank you. Now, I realize we've gone a little over, so I should probably wrap that up there, and if people have further questions, they can come up and ask people, get us back on track. Um, so what I would just say in conclusion, uh, before I invite you to thank the, the panel here, is I've been very heartened that nobody actually talked about culture, because one of the things we've discovered is that uh, Europeans who come to MIT and that area are as fabulously entrepreneurial as any of the local Americans, and also that we can take the lessons from MIT to other parts of Europe, whether it's North Scotland or, or Southern Spain. So I think we have grounds for optimism here, and I think that sets us up very nicely for the next panel led by the European Commission, because it's really those executive agencies that need to take forward some of these lessons. And while we were fretting yesterday that we couldn't see much of an ROI on our R&D in FTP and GDP. Uh, actually, if you put the three-letter acronyms aside and talk about the people and take Manuel's uh, impassioned uh, plea last night to, to think about the people, I think there are reasons for optimism. So please join me in thanking this fabulous panel. And I believe it's now coffee break.